I believe it's time to begin our service this evening. We certainly appreciate, uh, sincerely appreciate your presence and, and your faith. And we, it's a joy to the people of God to come together. Uh, not only a joy, but an honor and a privilege and uh, to uh, worship the true and living God. Our singing this evening will be about mercy and love. Our first song is 180. <clears throat> 180. We'll have a couple of songs and then a, a prayer. Come, let us all unite to sing. God is love. Let heaven and earth their praises bring. God is love. Let every soul from sin awake. Each in his heart sweet music make. And sing with us for Jesus' sake, for God is love. God is love. God is love. Come, let us all unite to sing that God is To earth's remotest bound, God is love. In Christ we have redemption found, God is love. His blood has washed our sin away. His spirit turned our night to day, and now we can rejoice to say that God is love. God is love. God is love. Come, let us all. Unite to sing that God is love. How happy is our portion here. God is love. His promise is our spirit cheer. God is love. Our sun and shield by day, our help, our hope, our strength and stay. He will be with us all the way. Our God is love. God is love. God is. Love. God is God is love. Our next song, 495. 495. <clears throat> Oh, the death and the riches of God's saving grace Falling down from the cross for me There the dead for my sins by the Savior was paid In his suffering on Calvary 
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to meet here and learn about your word and worship you. We pray that these worship services today are pleasing to you. And, and we thank you, Lord, for your son Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and, and everything that that does for us. Lord, thank you for allowing us to meet without any interference or persecution that exists in many parts of the world. And please forgive us for our sins. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. One hundred forty one. One hundred forty one.
405 will be the last song that I sang before I left you this evening. The divine all love excelling joy of heaven earth drawn down takes in us by humble dwelling all thy faithful mercy crown gives us thou Tonight's scripture reading will be taken from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom all, for it became him from whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons into glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctified and he and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Have you ever been really excited about a new thing that you are hoping to buy? Uh, maybe something you've saved up for, maybe something that you have dreamed about, maybe a trip that you want to take, whatever it may be. I think we've all got something or many things that we get excited about uh, that, that we look forward to or maybe a position we're about to hold or a job or a new house that we're building or uh, all sorts of things that go on in our life 
that we look forward to, that we get excited about. And again, sometimes you've saved up for it. Uh, Jonah really wanted a particular video game uh, system, and he used his money to buy most of it, and Ada bought a game for it with her money, and I think it means a lot more when you do that kind of thing, and they have been wanting it for a long time. A long time in their life is not as long as it may be in your life, but a long time for them, and uh, we get in our minds that we want this thing and we can't get it out of our head. Maybe it's a pair of shoes, maybe it's a certain clothing item, maybe it's a a coat in the wintertime, a specific type. Again, a house, a truck, a tool, an appliance. And then when you get it, if you get it, what do you do with it? Do you hide it or do you show it off? Are you excited? Do you want to tell people that you were able to have this thing or go to this place or have this vacation, whatever it may be? Oftentimes we want to share that with our friends and we want to to enjoy it with the people that we love. I remember when I was, I guess, seventh or eighth grade, and I really, really wanted a pair of shoes. They were a pair of shoes specifically called Nike Air Hirachis. That's what they were called. And uh, funny enough, they actually came back in style. And now it's a repeat, same kind of shoe. But, uh, but I wanted the original pair that came out. And my parents agreed to let us spend our, they, they gave us a back to school sort of trip to go and get new clothes and things like that. And this particular year, she said, this is how much money you have. I'm going to let you decide what you're going to get with that money. So I think I ended up getting that one pair of shoes and maybe one pair of pants and one shirt because that's all I could afford because <laughs> those shoes were more than I probably should have spent on them. But I was, I was really wanting them. And I remember sitting there dreaming about the first day of school when I actually got to wear those new shoes and, and go to school with that new outfit on. And uh, sometimes when we get something like that in our mind, it, it sort of takes over other things that are truly important and we end up caring so much more about that thing. There have been other times not talking about physical possessions, but maybe I've done something or said something to someone to make myself look better, to be funny in class, or to be, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we put others down in order to build ourselves up to make us feel more popular, to make us feel. I remember a specific incident. I don't think I was normally someone who said something to someone else unkind and pointing out something, but in this particular instance, I think I was about the same age. Maybe I had shoes on my head, and that's all I cared about. I don't know. But there was this girl, and I said something that wasn't real nice, and everybody laughed. But as soon as it happened, I felt this guilt come over me. I felt this feeling of, man, I really shouldn't have done that. I I focused on the wrong thing. I focused on popularity from friends over kindness over love, over caring for someone else. I focused on my own personality, my own popularity, wanting to be liked. So my lesson tonight is entitled, What If Jesus Cared? What if Jesus cared? Obviously, hopefully, will pique your ear enough to where you say, what, what is he going to talk about? If that is his title, what if Jesus cared? Before we get started too much into the lesson, I want to go ahead and do things a little uh, maybe abnormal. When the time comes tonight, you know, we specifically, when we get up here and present a lesson from God's Word, at the end of it, it is tradition to offer an invitation. I want you to know and I think you all do, that the invitation is always open. Invitation to come to Jesus, to give up your life, and become a Christian, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, is always there as an invitation by God, by Christ. But we find it an appropriate time when we come together as a church to offer an invitation 
so that if you have that desire, you can become a Christian. And here's a great opportunity, and we invite you to do so, and we sing a song, and we stand up, and we're going to do that tonight. But I'm going to go ahead and let you know that that's going to happen after this lesson. Also, if you have anything that you want prayers or help with in a public way, we're offering that always too, but specifically after we finish this lesson. So I wanted to go ahead and offer that now, and at the end, re realize that that is your opportunity if you would like to come tonight to become a Christian or to, uh, but if you want to do it at midnight, call me then too, and I'll come up here and we'll do that together. It's always open and available. God's invitation, Christ's invitation. But as we go into this lesson, what if Jesus cared? So I'm going to give you five different things to focus on having to do with that lesson. So if you're taking notes, here you go. What if Jesus cared about money? What if Jesus cared about money is my first point. You know, Jesus had all the power God had, has all the power God has. If you've seen me, you've seen my father. He could have done all sorts of things to make money while he was here on this earth, if that was a focus that he had. If that was something he wanted was riches, he could have been rich in the physical sense. He could have worked out some deal with the government and been the highest authority of the Roman government and made people give him money and been the wealthiest man alive. After all, he's God, the son. He was there when it was all created. Nothing was made without him. And he came to this earth. He could have been the richest man alive, no doubt. What if Jesus cared about money the way that people do? 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. He gave it all up for poverty on this earth, for poor living on this earth as in he became one of us, took on this fleshly life for a time to live like us and then to die for us. He became poor for our sake so that we could become rich in him. Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, similarly. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Again, this is Philippians 2, verse 7 through 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Yes, Jesus could have come and been all about physical wealth and shown all the things that he could have under that wealth. What if Jesus cared, point number two, about power? Similar to money, we think of power, but it's also different than just having money. But what if Jesus cared about power more than he cared about serving and saving us? sacrificing himself what if he cared about power he could have destroyed all forms of power that were on the earth he could have taken a rightful seat of the throne of the world and ruled it like no other that any king or pharaoh could only dream about that kind of power and I believe his apostles and his followers were waiting for that to happen. When are you going to take Israel and become the king in that way? I think that's what they were waiting for him to do. Some may even say that Jesus coming to the earth and dying on the cross was a mistake. It, it, didn't, it wasn't supposed to go that way. He was supposed to rule the world. Read the Bible. That's not what it says. It was no mistake. He could have had the power 
up to the control of this world if that's what he wanted. But that's not the way it was supposed to happen. It was no mistake what he did. It was known. It was foretold. If Jesus was meant to do that and have power over this world, that's what he would have done. He could have called more than 72,000 angels. You know, we sing the song, 10,000 angels. But the man who actually wrote that song, I believe his name was Ray Overholt, in around 1958-1959, later realized that that was far too little for 12 legions. Around 6,000 people would, was what a legion would have been in that time. So we're talking over 12, uh, I'm sorry, 72,000 angels Jesus could have called. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26, verses 51 through 54. Matthew 26, 51 through 54. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Some might say Peter wasn't going for his ear, but rather for his head, and he missed. Nevertheless, Jesus said to him, Put your swords back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? And he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? That was not what he came here to do. He could have called more than 72,000 angels just like that. But that's not what he came here to do. He left the splendor of heaven for a reason. Yet he could have called 72,000 angels, more than 72,000. Luke 4, verse 29 through 30. Luke 4, 29 through 30. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built. They didn't go there to praise Jesus. They, go, they went there to throw him off the cliff. And it says that specifically in Luke 4, 29 through 30. So that they could throw him down the cliff. They went to the brow of the hill. But passing through their midst, he went away. So do you think he just said, excuse me, excuse me, I need to get by here? Or do you think it was a miracle? Do you think that many people shoving him off the cliff that he could have just asked to be excused? I believe that was a miracle. It doesn't specifically say that, but it leads you to believe that. Nevertheless, no matter what, Jesus prevented it from happening. Passing through their midst, he went away. If he'd have come here and didn't have the power to stop what had to be stopped at the right time, then he wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have been able to do it after all the anger and hatred they had towards him. He came for a reason, and it wasn't his time yet. John chapter 10, verse 39, similarly, Again they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. That's John 10, 39. And then... A few chapters before that, John 7, verse 30. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because he, his hour had not yet come. It was not his time. Jesus had power. Jesus knew his role. He knew what he came here to do. If it wouldn't have been so, then it wouldn't have happened. He had power, but thankfully, Jesus didn't care about what we think of as power, having power or control over people. He came to serve, not to be served. And if he didn't have power, he wouldn't have been able to just go through those people. He wouldn't have been able to escape and get out of these situations with all these people that hated him so easily. 
His time came when it came, and he accepted it. Not my will, but yours be done. Point number three. What if Jesus cared about being understood more than he cared about serving and saving us? What if Jesus cared about being understood? He could have read the hearts of people as he did and then put in them understanding. He could have done that. He could do anything he wants to do. But Jesus didn't do that. He read the hearts of men and he tried to explain things to him as a man, as them as a man. But even to his closest followers, the Holy Spirit had not come to give them all truth yet. And even they were confused many times. You can read all the instances yourself. We'll go through a few. But he didn't do that because he cared more about serving us than making us understand him while he was there. And in the garden, one of the times that I think I can't imagine what he was going through, the pain, the suffering, knowing what was about to take place, and yet in Matthew 26, 37 through 46 approximately, you can read the happenings of him going to the garden and telling his apostles, his disciples, to sit while he goes to pray, tells them that his soul is very sorrowful. Jesus is talking to them, saying these things. You think that they would listen and realize this is serious. And he said even to death his soul is very sorrowful. But how many times did they fall asleep while he was in the garden praying? And he came back to them and came back to them. Don't go to sleep. If he wanted them to understand what he was going through at that moment, he could have made them understood, understand. John 13, verse 7. So he's washing their feet, is about to wash their feet, and Jesus is talking to Peter here, and Jesus answered him, what I am doing to you, you do not understand now, but after you, afterward you will understand. The very next chapter, John 14, verse 9, after telling Thomas uh, that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one goes to the Father except through him, Jesus says to Philip, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? I can't imagine the frustration Jesus had having his closest followers misunderstand who he was, what he was there to do, and yet he still didn't make them understand. If that's what he cared about most, he would have made it happen, but he cared more about serving and saving. I'm always wanting when I'm having a class, when I'm having a devotional, when I'm preaching, when I'm talking to my children, when Pam and I have discussions, I want to be understood. And I don't think I'm the only one. Sometimes when I feel like no one understands me, it's like the loneliest feeling ever. I can be in a room full of people, but if I don't feel understood, I feel alone. No one gets me. Does no one see it from my point of view? Can you imagine how Jesus felt? Talk about feeling alone, destitute. What he was about to go through, and his closest friends didn't even get it. Acts chapter 1, verses 5 through 6. This is after he has died on the cross, raised from the grave. Listen to this. Acts chapter 1, verses 5 through 6. <clears throat> right before he ascends to heaven. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So, after he said that, then he said, uh, so when, or then it says, so when they had come together, they asked him. After he says, not many days from now, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They ask him, Lord, will you at that time or at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They still didn't get it. He'd already died on the cross and been raised from the dead, and they're still apparently waiting for this physical kingdom, for Israel to be reestablished and for him to set up his right throne 
in this world. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus was misunderstood so much in his life on this earth. But that's what, not why he came, to make people understand him. Thankfully, we have all the readings and we can read through and get the whole point. We've got the whole complete, perfect word of God in front of us. And they didn't at that point. We think it's so easy. Why don't you get it? He came what he said to do. He, he did what he said he was going to do. Why don't they get it? But we weren't living then. We weren't in their shoes. If he wanted them to understand, he could have made them understand. But he came to serve and to save. What if Jesus cared about himself more than others? What if he cared about the comforts of this life more than he cared about serving and saving? When he was tired, he could have left the crowds at any point. He could have stopped teaching. He could have stopped performing miracles. He could have gone to enjoy this heaven and earth that he was there during creation to, to just have at his disposal. Enjoy the fruits of their labor. Could have decided he wanted a quiet home and just to go on vacation and enjoy this earthly life for a little while, for three or so years, the last three years of his life. But he didn't choose to do that. He didn't choose to care about the comforts of this life and to be selfish with his short time on this earth. He didn't even have a place to lay his head. He left the splendor of heaven. It doesn't talk about how rich Jesus was. It doesn't talk about the nice shoes he, got, he had on his feet. It talks about other things. He could have, you know, introduced the world to air conditioning and hot tap water if he wanted to, but he didn't come to do that. He didn't come to enjoy the life on this earth. He came to die for it, for us. Hebrews 2, 9 through 11, which we've already heard, talks about him being lower, being made lower than the angels, and yet he was crowned with glory and honor because of the sufferings of death. He was crowned with glory and honor because, because of the sufferings of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. He did that for all of us so we didn't have to. For it was fitting that he, for whom, by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctified and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Sort of sounds familiar. Count it all joy when you have trials. Rejoice when you go through tribulations. Sounds similar, doesn't it? He was crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering. God was proud of him. Matthew 8, verse 19 through 20. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And what did Jesus say to him? He said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Maybe he's saying to this guy that's saying, I want to follow you, I'll follow you wherever you go. He's, maybe he's saying to him, are you sure? Because I don't even have a place to lay my head. Are you sure you're willing to actually commit to that, to give up your life of comfort, to give up your life of wherever you live and roam around this earth with me? having people hate you, being poor, maybe not know the next time you're going to have a meal, having nowhere to lay your head. Are you sure you want to follow me? Jesus didn't come to have the comforts of this life. Jesus didn't come to be selfish. And lastly, what if Jesus cared about popularity and having friends more than he cared about serving us, sacrificing himself for us. He performed so many miracles, and yet in the end, they rejected him. He told them, he showed them, he healed them, he taught them, and they crucified him. 
The human race crucified Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, and people still don't give him the credit today. You can go online. You can watch a show. Everybody denies. Not everybody. But so much of the world denies that he is the Son of God. Even after all the proof, after all the documentation, after the perfect word of God, they still deny that he is the Son of God. Jesus didn't come for popularity. He didn't come to win the friendship contest. He came to die for all of us. He was denied by Peter, betrayed by Judas, seemingly left by his closest friends in the worst of times. He was mocked, he was spat upon, they took his clothes. They were so angry with him that they released Barabbas instead of him just so that he could be crucified, so that Jesus would be. Do you think he would have liked a few more people on his side in that moment, in that hour? And all the horrible thoughts of physical pain, oftentimes when I'm taking the Lord's Supper, I think about the emotional pain. I think about the physical, too, and what his body had to endure. But often I think of the emotional pain that he went through, the spiritual distress of having to bear every single person's sin in the past, in the present, and for the future. All laid on him. He deserved none of it. He took it all for you and for me. Jesus didn't come to be popular. He came to save us. If you want to read John chapter 18 and 19, I encourage you to do so. And tell me if you think Jesus had enough friends. Matthew chapter 10 verse 22 through 23 says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. What if that's the way we handled it? What if we knew we were going to be hated? We did it anyway. And when we preached the word of God and they persecuted us, we just went to the next town. What if that's the way we did it? We just kept on preaching. Kept on telling people about Jesus no matter what they did to us. John chapter 15 verse 18, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Why do we care so much of what the world thinks of us? I guess it's because we live in it. Just like the apostles, just like the disciples, we live this physical world and it's really hard to get our heads out of it. That's why we need to come together. That's why we need to worship him and get our minds off of this world and the things in it that we want to accomplish, that we want to have. Separating our, ourselves from it so that we can go into it and be stronger for it. To fight the good fight. And if that's what God wanted to happen, was for Jesus to come and have friends, or to be popular, or to have money, or to have power, or any of the other things that we've discussed, to be understood, then that's what would have happened. But that's not what he wanted. Jesus came to serve and to save. He could have called 72 plus thousand angels, but he died alone for you and me. John 18, 36, Jesus here talking to Pilate, and Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. What would have happened if his kingdom were of this world? Well, he tells him, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. There it is, right there, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. It's something better, something greater. I don't care about fame and fortune. I don't care whether you like me or not. I'm here to save you. And hopefully I, you'll choose me eventually is what Jesus wants. Even while he's hanging on the cross, have mercy. He loves you. He loves me. He came to serve, not to be served. He came to set up a spiritual kingdom, not a physical kingdom. He came to show us that last shall be first, first shall be last. Jesus already won the battle. We don't have to. He's already done it. He won the war over sin, and now we can have the opportunity to be with him in heaven. 
I love this scripture, John 16. This is my last one. John 16, verse 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. He just goes ahead and lays it out there. You're going to have problems. But take heart. I've overcome the world. He's already done it. You don't have to do it. He did it for you. You just have to live for him. He came to serve and to save. What if he cared about all the things that normal people cared about? Ask, ask yourself this. If, if Jesus, if rather, if the world will, were full of people like me, would it be better or would it be worse? What if Jesus cared about all the things that the world cares about? If you have any reason to come forward tonight, please do so as we stand and sing. Fold of God, hear you not the invitation? Oh, prepare to meet thy God, careless soul. Oh, heed the warning, for your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad. The judgment unprepared to meet thy God. Why so thoughtless are you standing while the pleading years go by and your life is spent in folly? Oh, prepare to meet thy God. One hundred seventy-one. We'll sing this song, and then we'll have a closing prayer. And if there's anyone that hasn't had the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper, it can be served to you in the uh, chapel at the re uh, front or rear, whichever way you look at it. But uh, you can go there at this time if need be. One hundred seventy-one. Uh, we sure would like to encourage you to be back with us Wednesday evening. I believe Buddy Hope will be speaking with us. And uh, if you would like to review yourself, I believe he's going to be in Matthew 22, 23, 24, according to the bulletin. <clears throat> hear God's word and uh, more our faith increases and builds and the closer we uh, come toward God. <clears throat> 171. Uh, I'm not sure if y'all know this song here, but it's a beautiful song to 
keep in our hearts and take with us as we depart. <clears throat> Would you bow with me, please? Let's again this evening, our loving Heavenly Father, we come thankful for the day you've given us and all the many blessings you've given us in this life. We're thankful for the opportunities that we've had to meet out this evening and ask that you'd always allow us to live in a land where we have that opportunity and we will always take advantage of it. We're thankful for being able to worship, and we hope the things that we've done and said today have been in accordance with your will. We ask that you would help us to take the lessons we've heard and apply them to our lives. We also ask that you would forgive us as we go forward that uh, of the many ways that we fall short in your sight, and we ask you to help us to learn from these mistakes and hopefully be stronger and better Christians in the future than we've been in the past. Guide us throughout the coming week. Help us to do those things that are right. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.